This conference will now be recorded. All right. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for attending today. I'd like to thank the New Haven Apex chapter for inviting me to share this presentation and for John Sawyer, who joined one of our demand driven planner classes last year, continues to believe in and share this methodology. As I said, we're recording this session and the link to that recording will be sent out to everyone who registered. Uh, a PDF of the presentation is also available that uh, can be requested through John and John will also be sending out a survey for your feedback on the session, plus things like uh, ideas for future topics, uh, the timing of these kinds of events, and then, and then of course the value of this delivery method on its own. So with that, I will start through. This is a presentation that was uh, performed at the ASCM conference in 2019 by Carol Patak and Chad Smith. And the title is The Major Innovations of Demand-Driven Material Requirements Planning. My subtitle is called How to Bring Order Out of Chaos. So perhaps one of your first questions is, who the heck is this guy? So I became involved with Demand Driven back in 2012. Uh, learned about it actually at the Apex conference in Denver and decided to keep an eye on it. And it wasn't very long before I started down the road of certification. In the meantime, I became an Apex instructor. And then I decided that maybe teaching Demand Driven would be an okay uh, future for me. And they agreed that that would be possible. So I have developed since then several classes that I teach. And I, at the same time, I am president of the Apex Twin Cities chapter up here in Minneapolis. So let's jump right in. Before we get right to the methodology, I like to talk about a couple of our supply chain challenges today. Those of you that are Apex members, uh, have probably heard of these before. Uh, anybody who's um, been in any sort of industry role knows that our constant search is for visibility. And visibility uh, has been a challenge for us for years. Now, most people take visibility and say, we need a better forecast. <clears throat> and if we just have a better forecast, that's the visibility we need. But I would submit that there's some other things we need visibility into that I don't think we have today. And one of those things is the, to answer the question, is what I'm doing today to fix this problem, is it working? And is it working in the way I expected it to work? Right? I want a part shortages problem, but I'm looking at this aggregation of uh, total inventory and did I reduce my total inventory? Well, perhaps as a person down in the in the weeds, down doing the work, that total inventory is not my problem. The individual part shortages are my problem or the individual excesses are my problem. So can I actually tell if what I'm doing to fix those problems are working? Velocity. I don't think there's anybody who thinks that the pace of change is uh, decreasing and disruption is has become maybe one of our uh, constant things that we face. <clears throat> and all customers are expecting fast responses when they make a change. And the last one is variability, right? Expectations when we when we achieve reality and we compare that to our expectations, chaos is the result. And what we're using are precision tools and they don't handle that very well. So when your forecast was for 100 and it turns out that you needed 98 or 102, there's some chaos created there. Forget about forecasts. Sometimes, I know this has never happened to you guys, but sometimes the customer places an order and then they want it on a different date than they originally asked for. 
and that causes a little bit of chaos as well. And what we end up with as symptoms is we have things like rescheduling, constant. We run a lot of overtime. We are expediting freight in or out. We have inventory problems. And one that often gets left aside, employee morale is not doing as well as we would like. Are we ready to concede that doing the wrong things faster is not the solution? And perhaps we need to look in a slightly new direction to find what will help us. Now, usually we put this at the end, but I like to put it at the beginning in the webinar to make sure we understand that the results of this methodology, and you can see on this graphic that there are multiple industries and there's more than that, but we've kind of consolidated down into uh, some so that we can see an example. <clears throat> the result of using demand-driven MRP is an increase in our service level, a reduction in our lead time promised to our customers, and an overall inventory reduction. And you can see, I don't know which one of those is more important to you, but inventory reduction at an average of 30% less inventory is astounding. And that alone should be enough to make you want to take a look at this. The lead time reduction, right, at 22%. If you promise people um, four weeks and you can now do it in three weeks or 10 days, you can now do it in eight days, those are order winner um, type of changes. So uh, this was put together after a lot of implementations so you can see uh, the results and hopefully that kind of piques your interest. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about flow and flow becoming our main objective and then we're going to point out some challenges to flow like we don't have enough challenges already. We're going to talk about what is DDMRP, or Demand Driven Material Requirements Planning. And then we're going to go through the four main innovations of Demand Driven MRP and how they impact us. And you'll find that they are not, uh, they are not a, a 180 degree change in our thinking, but they are significant and they make a huge impact, even though the change is relatively small and elegant. So, <clears throat> emphasizing flow. Flow is actually the determinant of success. What do we mean by that? When flow is occurring, service is consistent and reliable. And I should point out, we're talking about systemic flow, right? The entire flow of your business. So, service, consistent and reliable. That would be a good thing. Revenue, maximized and protected. Inventories are right-sized for your business, and those ancillary or unnecessary expenses are minimized. Cash flow follows the rate of product flow to market demand. So what we end up with is an operations goal that if we protect and promote flow, we will maximize our return on investment. Now, how do we explain flow? There's a fairly simple equation, but flow is the rate at which a system converts material to product, and that product has to be required by a customer. Flow is not the rate at which we make stock. It has to connect to a customer requirement. Cash velocity is the rate of net cash generation. How fast are we generating cash? And net profit over investment, of course, is the equation for return on investment. Now we can quantify flow through something called Little's Law. And if we know the throughput and the lead time, then we can determine our WIP. If we know the WIP and the lead time, we can determine our throughput. And of course, 
if we know the whip and the throughput, we can determine our lead time. But perhaps the more important statement is that flow is a direct contributor to the company vitals. What in the world are company vitals? Imagine if you go into an emergency room, they check three things, right? They check your three vitals. What are those? First one, are you breathing? Second one, uh, what's your temperature? And the third one, some measure related to your heart rate, your pulse, your blood pressure, those kinds of things. So we have three vitals. If any one of those is out of line for you, you get to go to the front of the line, which isn't necessarily where you want to be in an emergency room, but those are important. Now with a company, you also have three vitals, working capital, contribution margin, and your customer base. You can imagine if you've got all your working capital tied up, then you can't work on any new projects. And you can also imagine if you have very poor contribution margins, it doesn't really matter how much you sell if you're not making any money on it. And of course, if you start losing your customers, that's also going to be a problem because you have no one left to sell to. So these three company vitals need to be balanced and in alignment. In the graphic, they're in the center in the green zone. As they move outside of that green zone and get all the way out to the red zone, that's where you put your focus and get that back into line. It turns out the better things flow, the better controlled costs will be in any particular period. The opposite of that, which is if we focus on cutting cost, flow does not necessarily improve. Sometimes we focus on cutting costs and our end result, the impact that we have, is that we actually increase cost. And that's a hard one to get our heads wrapped around. Flow is also the common objective across many of the disciplines that we're all using today. MRP, the objective is to synchronize demand and supply. We want a flow product based on customer demand. Lean, our objective is to reduce waste. In fact, reduce waste, what do we accomplish? We improve flow. Theory of constraints, the objective is to improve system throughput. What's another word for system throughput? System flow. And in Six Sigma, we want to reduce variability. If we reduce variability, what do we improve? We improve flow. The flow is at the center of all of these objectives. And you can have an argument over whether you want to do lean or Six Sigma or theory of constraints or MRP. But the reality is all of them are focused on improving flow. So whichever method makes sense and makes an improvement in your company flow, that's the system that you should be working in. And so you can pick and choose between these systems. You don't have to be uh, one or the other. And of course, George Plossel had a, had a rule that he developed that all benefits will be directly related to the speed of flow of materials and information. Now, what are the challenges to flow? It sounds real simple to say, just, just work on flow. But we have some challenges, don't we? If you haven't heard of it, we live in a VUCA world. What's in that VUCA world? What does the VUCA stand for? Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And it certainly has done uh, a number on our understanding of this in the last couple of months. If we look at and compare supply chain carrier characteristics from 1965 to today, you see there's a lot of differences there. And I don't need to go through all of these, but customer tolerance times. The customer used to wait for the product. Now, we don't wait so well anymore. Complexity, customization, and variety, all are high and they used to be low. Forecast accuracy, used to be high, 
now it's low. Pressure for leaner inventories. I doubt that any of you are living in a world where someone isn't asking you to reduce your overall inventory. And that one always tricks me up because if you have parts that you don't have enough of, you don't reducing those isn't going to help you. So we need to figure out what items we need to have more of and what items we need to have less of. And the last one is interesting to me, transactional friction. Um, it used to take a lot to make a purchase. When I was a kid, we would get a catalog in the mail and you would have to fill out a form, transfer from the catalog onto that form what you wanted to order, add up the amount of money you should send plus shipping and handling, put a check in that, you put it in an envelope, put a little stamp on it, and you take it out to the end of your driveway and put it in this, uh, ours was silver, you put it in a, a metal tube at the end of your driveway, and then in, in a few hours, a wizard comes by and delivers that letter to where it's supposed to go. We don't do that so much anymore. We have, uh, in terms of buying things, what does it take? One click one click and the other side of transactional friction is how long how do you search for a new supplier we used to use something called thomas register and you sort through the books trying to figure out where your where your next new supplier could come from what do we do today six letters google within a few hours you can have a series of candidates I'm not suggesting within a few hours you would choose that supplier, but you can narrow down a short list of candidates in a few hours that you can then um, make a determination between. So it's easier to purchase things and it's easier to find new places to purchase those things. But something is fundamentally broken in our world today. And I think we can all agree that there's two universal points of inventory. Point A, where we have too little, and point B, where we have too much. And it doesn't require a huge leap of faith to realize that where we wanna be is in between those two points. Sounds simple, right? But determining how much is too little and how much is too much is in fact the struggle that we've had for years and the struggle that demand driven brings uh, to the table. I like to tell a story here about uh, we had an apex meeting. Our, our year end meeting usually was not too supply chain centric, but we had one in June about five years ago that we had the uh, a meteorologist from one of the TV stations. And I thought, well, that'll be fun, but I'm not going to learn anything. And of course, since then, the first words out of her mouth are something that I tell everybody I've run into. She said, as a meteorologist, when they get to work, the first thing they do is check the current conditions. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool if when I walked into work, I could check my inventory's current conditions or my schedules? My, my machining center schedule, I could check those current conditions and I could find out, am I in the too little range, too much range, or am I in the optimal range? So that seemingly fun PDM opened a new doorway for me. <clears throat> now the funny part, or not so funny, is most companies, exhibit what we call the bimodal distribution. You've got a lot of parts where you don't have enough, a lot of parts around too little, and then you've got a lot of parts around too much, and you've got almost no parts in that optimal range. So we've all just agreed that we'd like to have our, our, our inventory balances in that optimal range, and in fact, uh, what we're doing today does not put us there. It leaves a lot of people unhappy, and with every run of MRP, parts move from the too little to the too much, and they go back and forth, oscillating 
into infinity. And 90% of companies report this bimodal distribution. And what we end up with is three bottom line effects to companies. We have chronic shortages at the very same time we have excessive inventory. And then we have high expedite expenses and waste as we try and fix the chronic shortages. But the real problem is at a higher level. Everybody on the call has probably heard of the bullwhip effect, originally called the Forrester effect, but essentially, uh, and it's Apex Dictionary, uh, Dictionary for years, an extreme change in the supply position upstream generated by a small change in demand downstream in the supply chain, right? So what you see in the graphic is the transference of a small change at one end and it bull whips until it becomes a huge change at the other end. And that transference and amplification of that disturbance, if you will, in our supply chains gets worse and worse and creates huge problems. The more parts you have and the longer the lead times you have and the more steps in the process, the worse the effect. What can be done? Well, that is an excellent question. I'm glad you asked. Demand-driven MRP, what is it? Demand-driven MRP is a method to model, plan, and manage supply chains to protect and promote the flow of relevant information and materials. Right? We talked about that. Protect and promote flow of information and materials, and let's make sure that information and materials is relevant. But it's a, a method to model, plan, and manage. Okay, so DDMRP uses strategic decoupling points, inventory pockets, if you will, placed in strategic areas. And then it uses those decoupling points to drive supply order generation. In other words, the release of purchase orders or manufacturing orders and separately manage, manage those open orders the expediting, the pull-ins, the push-outs, the changes, right? MRP by itself, the P stands for planning. And so MRP gives you a plan, and then you are the execution function. You figure out, based on that plan, what you really want to do, and you implement those things into MRP, and then it gives you a new plan the next day. And since you've chosen not to do some of the things that it recommended, now it starts yelling at you and telling you, you have to do these, you have to do them fast, you have to do them now. DDMRP separates the execution and the planning functions and gives you a little bit of a breather. So just because you need to release an, a purchase order doesn't mean you have to expedite it on day one. Now this methodology was first articulated in 2011 and came through like MRP, came through years of research and application by practitioners who were trying to solve a problem. It is built on the pillars of material requirements planning, distribution requirements planning, lean, theory of constraints, Six Sigma, and four bits of in innovation that we're going to talk about along with the application of that innovation uh, to come up with an entire program and through those innovations merged with the mainstream improvement disciplines that we all know about we come up with a new mantra which is position protect and pull now because it's based on these pillars you don't have to throw away what you know, right? MRP, is it valid? 
Absolutely, the equations are still accurate, but the world around us has changed in such a way that perhaps they don't work quite like we thought. And so we need to protect those equations. Lean, still valid? Absolutely. And there's a couple of ways we'll talk about where that is, is impacting. Theory of constraints, Six Sigma, all still valid. Don't throw them away. We're just gonna add in the innovations and adapt. So the five components of DDMRP. Number one is position. We talked about it slightly. Strategic decoupling. We are going to place inventory, in this case, in strategic places and decouple between uh, the two work centers or entities where we've placed that inventory. Once we've figured out where we're gonna place that inventory, we need to know how much inventory we should keep there. Right? If you remember our, our too little and too much, how do we determine that just right setting? And that's done with buffer profiles and levels. Is it a manufactured part or a purchase part? What are the lead times? What are the average daily usages? Et cetera, et cetera. Step number three is dynamic adjustments. As average daily usage is increasing, we need to take that into account as it's happening not wait for a once a month review. So we need to make those adjustments dynamic. Step number four is demand-driven planning. Once we have done steps one, two, and three, then we should be able to trust the system to tell us what orders we need to place, right? The demand-driven planning is about placing or releasing orders. And one of the things that we don't do today, at least I've, I haven't found very many people who trust their MRP output exactly as it is presented to them, right? We dump it into spreadsheets and we try and figure out what we really should do. With demand-driven MRP, we put our work in up front so that we can trust what MRP is telling us to do. And step number five is visible and collaborative of execution, again, the separation of planning from execution allows us to look with different information at the same part numbers, and we've made it simple enough that anyone can look at the uh, order in which execution should happen and understand clearly what the priorities are. <clears throat> so the innovations of DDMRP. The first one is decoupled lead time. MRP only understands two types of lead time. The first one is manufacturing or purchase lead time. We're combining that into one time depending on, on uh, which part you're dealing with. And the second is the cumulative lead time through the entire structure. Neither one of those is very accurate in terms of uh, the lead time you would give to the customer. For example, FPB has a, a manufacturer lead time of one day. Very few of you are gonna give a one day lead time on a finished product. Uh, the second one is cumulative lead time where we're at one, two, three, two, eight, we're at 16. 16 days now is too long. So we have a problem with figuring out our lead times. DDMRP places decoupling points at strategically determined places. And I'll just make the statement here that strategically determined places mean one person can't go into a closed room and figure it out. There's, there's six different factors to determine whether you need inventory there or not. And one person doesn't have all of the information. So in this structure, here's your introduction to what the decoupling points look like or the, the DDMRP buffers. It's a, a bucket with a green, yellow, and red zone. The decoupling point is not new, right? We've known about this for years. It's been in the APEX dictionary. We didn't necessarily know the impact and the importance of choosing wisely where we put them. So the placement of these decoupling points gives us a shorter independent lead time horizons. 
right? And we now we have a new lead time. If we look at this diagram and we say SAA, PPX, and PPZ, if I know I have those parts and I've set up a system where I know I'm going to have those parts, now I can say that I have a lead time of one day to make FPV and two days for SAL. That means I have a lead time of three. That is not uh, the manufacturer lead time and is not the cumulative lead time. So here's the new lead time put into place with a lead time of three. If, if you're giving your lead time to the customer for FPV, perhaps you would say four or five. Maybe you wouldn't jump right to three until you've proven that it'll work. But it gives us a way to mathematically understand what the real lead time is that it will take to make that product. <clears throat> and it's defined as the longest unprotected sequence in the item's lower level product structure legs. So you can see the lead time for SAA becomes 10 because there's no buffer underneath there. The lead time for SAG becomes 10 because there's no buffer underneath there. The decoupled lead time, right? And we use that decoupled lead time to compress our lead times to market requirements. In other words, if you have a customer who says, you know what, I'll give you 20 days. I don't, I don't need the stuff right away. Then you don't need to put any buffers here because your cumulative lead time is 16. If you have a customer that says, I need, it's gotta be less than four days. Well, then here's a structure that gives you a three day lead time. And so you've met that market requirement. If your customer says, I need it in one day and it's a one day delivery time, then you have to put a buffer at your finished product. It helps us determine more realistic lead times when necessary. I always used to marvel at how uh, customer service came up with the lead times that they would tell the customer. And it was really just flying by the seat of their pants with, it looks like about four weeks out, looks like three weeks out. Um, but it was all based on, on uh, a lot of magic going on. <clears throat> it's also used to properly size the decoupling point buffers. You can imagine to, to determine how much inventory I need to hold at part number SAA, for example, I need to know the lead time. And in this case, I need to know the decoupled lead time. And that's what I will use to size that buffer. <clears throat> and then also it helps me to determine the, the high level inventory leverage points for additional decoupling. For example, if SAA is a very expensive part, I want to reduce the size of that buffer, and I can reduce the size of SAA by buffering PPA, or purchase part A, if it makes sense to do so. And because of some of the other things we're going to learn about, I will be able to say whether that makes sense or whether it doesn't make sense financially. All right, innovation number two, four questions that every planner cares about each day what is coming to me? What do I currently have? What demand do I need to fulfill immediately? And what future demand is relevant? So the net flow equation results, we daily we look at the net flow equation and what we end up with is the buffer status and it tells us whether or not we need to place an order. The net flow equation is simply what do I have on hand plus what do I have on order or my open supply minus the qualified sales order demand. The resulting net flow position is compared to the buffer. And if it falls outside of the green zone, in this case, it's in the yellow zone. If it's in the yellow or red zones, I place a supply order up to the top of the buffer. Pretty straightforward. But I bet you've all got a question, which is what is qualified sales order demand? And guess what? I got a slide for that. So qualified demand is the sales order amounts that are past due, due today, and the qualified spikes. 
you're right. There's a whole other question. What's a qualified spike? When I look at the future, I have an order spike horizon, which is a length of time in the future that I'm going to look to consider spikes, and an order spike threshold, which is the quantity in daily buckets, not in orders, but what's due on that day, to qualify to be included in the net flow equation. And we can see in this diagram, we have nothing past due, we have some items due today, and on day three, we have total items due that exceeds our order spike threshold. So we would include that as well. So here's an example. We've got our buffer, top of the buffer is 455. <clears throat> We've got our yellow and our red zones, and we don't get into it in this uh, presentation, but each of those zones has a reason for being and a separate way to calculate. And so um, when people think about safety stock, at least in my world, safety stock was kind of a random number thrown out there. I know there's a way to calculate it, but when people panic, that calculation goes out and we just throw in another number. <clears throat> this the red zone is for the safety, a little comfort level for us. The yellow zone is for the uh, what we call cycle stock or how much we're going to use during the lead time. And then the green zone has to do with our order size and frequency. And it's a little more complicated because there's three possible ways we can calculate that. But each of the zones has a reason for being. And they are not always proportional like that. In our example, so to understand the net flow equation, on hand we have 105, open supply 240, and then we have a qualified demand of 20. That gives us a net flow position of 325 and clearly puts us in the yellow. When we're in the yellow, we place an order up to the top of green. So the order recommendation is for 130. Innovation number three is the decoupled explosion. Goes along with the decoupled lead time, but let's talk about standard requirements explosion. Calculating demand for components based on the bill of materials. So what do we know about this? The end item demand, when that changes or when it is initiated, an explosion happens, it goes through the entire bill of materials, right? And if anything changes at that end item demand, then everything changes all the way through the bill of materials. And, you know, when I say it like that, you can see the chaos that results in something simple, like we went from 10, a quantity of 10 required, to 11. And then everything else had to change by one or two or three, depending on the usage per. And all of those things change. And maybe in this example with 12 parts to deal with, it's not that big of a deal, but not many of us are building parts that only have 12 components. Additionally, right, we talk about end item demand in terms of quantities usually, but what if the due date slides forward by a week? Everything else changes by a week. So you've now got to reach out to all your suppliers and all of your manufacturing centers to make those changes. And that is chaos. So the decoupled explosion says inside of our product structure, we're going to place these buffers. And here's the example that we've pulled forward for the buffers. The decoupled explosion starts when a part's net flow position enters the rebuild zone. What does that mean? Like the example we just went through, when our net flow position is not in the green, it's in the yellow or the red, that's called the rebuild zone. So the end item demand changes and the explosion stops at the next stocked position, no matter what. When those positions break into the yellow zone with their net flow so that we need to replenish, then 
we explode individually down to the next stock position. So it owned the explosion only restarts when the net position, net flow position calls for it to restart. Much smaller pockets of chaos to manage. Literally, it means independent dependence. Now, in between the decoupling points, DDMRP explodes in the exact same manner as MRP, right? Inside of the blue box highlighted, there's no buffers. So MRP is still functioning in there. DDMRP still seeks to net to zero when there isn't a decoupling point. It's one of the things that we didn't talk about but one of the reasons, when if you remember that graph, uh, that visual showing the difference from too little to too much, and we want to be in between those two, MRP, without DDMRP, MRP says, I want to be as close to zero as possible. I want to be as close to too little as possible. And then what have we done? We've invented something called safety stock, which takes us, when we place an order, now potentially we end up in the too much side so we go back and forth between too little and too much and the chaos continues the point the point here is don't throw out mrp it's mrp is still valid until you have a strategic decoupling point then we've got to use the ddmrp methodology Innovation number four has to do with uh, relative priority and both for planning and execution. So DDMRP focuses on priority by buffer status as opposed to priority by due date. Now, what's the difference? Example on the upper right, we have priority by due date. We have two items due on May 12th, one on May 14th, one on May 16th. Pretty straightforward what order we should make those in except for there's two due on the same day. If they are running through the same machining center or using the same labor, which one do I make first? Not sure. So let's move to the bottom graphic and talk about priority by buffer status. If with demand-driven MRP on my strategic parts, I can say, this is the amount of inventory I would like to have. This is my buffer then I can see that the first manufacturing order there has 12% of that buffer remaining. And the second one has 27% of it remaining. So I know I'm edging towards too little. So I also can see clearly that the 12% should be done first, the 27% second, the 53% and then the 61%. But, oh my gosh, look at the due dates. The one that's in the most trouble was due May 14th. It was third on my list from a due date perspective. Now, don't forget what you know. If you have an allergy sequence or a paint color sequence or some other reason that the changeovers make this not make sense, at least you know and you can make the decisions based on having the information that says, I know this 12% one is the one I should do first, but I'm choosing due to changeover reasons, to do it second or third. Or I'm choosing, due to customer requirements, I'm choosing to make it outside of the sequence. And yes, it will cost me more for that changeover, but here's why. So we can now make decisions with information more accurately. Relative priority means that for each of the strategic parts, you can quickly see the parts position relative to its own buffer level. 100% means we're full. 19%, for example, in this case, means we're in the red zone and we're in a little bit of trouble. And it also allows me to compare to other strategic items so I can see clearly what my order uh, of priority is. Now imagine on the left-hand side, those are all purchase parts. Imagine if I could give this list to my suppliers, and let's say I have to order, in this case, it's telling me to order all five 
of the parts in red and yellow, and I don't need to order the one in green. If those are all produced by the same supplier on the same piece of equipment, now the supplier can clearly see what order they should be working in and what order is most likely that we're going to need those in because this is the planning priority. It's not 100% aligned with the execution priority, but it can give them a pretty solid uh, process to say if they want to make 405P first, we're going to be in trouble on 406P. So maybe they should switch again using their logic and the conversations and the collaboration back with you so together you can make that decision. The right hand side goes back to our, our manufactured parts and we can see now we're looking at our on hand status and our priority of our on hand status. Whereas on the left for purchase parts, we're looking at the priority for um, releasing the purchase orders. Still on, on purchase parts, we can look at an on hand status and now we know whether we need to expedite a purchase order or not. So the critical difference is MRP, there's no decoupling, which makes everything dependent, forcing us to, do, to have longer planning horizons and accumulate much more variability. DDMRP strategically determines the decoupling points to compress the lead times and absorb bidirectionally that variability. MRP, not designed to manage stock positions, it was it is and designed to be the perfect make to order calculator. It nets to zero. DDMRP recognizes that our customers are not willing to wait the entire lead time. So we manage strategic stock positions. It never nets to zero at those strategic points. Most conventional safety stock and reorder points are static. We've set them and then we forget them. In my world, and history, I always was able to um, change safety stock whenever I got burned. And then I changed it a little bit higher than I probably needed to. <clears throat> in DDMRP, stock buffers are dynamically adjusted. Based on the consumption and the future known events, the buffers adjust. With MRP, we want to keep full safety stock at all costs. One of the things I like to point out to people is that the difference when MRP, the difference in the way MRP reacts, when MRP hits zero or MRP hits safety stock, there is no difference in the way MRP reacts. You put in a high safety stock, so you'd have a warning, but MRP tells you you're in, you're in uh, trouble and you need to react quickly. And then when you ignore that, the next day it yells louder. You really need to react to this. And you have to manage that um, separately from MRP. DDMRP assumes that safety will be used and it is normal to break into that level. MRP forecasted demand signal guarantees constant nervousness and expedites. With DDMRP, the supply order generation is tied directly to actual demand. There's no master production schedule or planned orders. There is pr the priorities that we just talked about. And MRP has priority by due date, which in my world, the minute you set a due date, it's not very long after that, that that due date is not valid anymore. And uh, DDMRP uses priority by buffer status. So we can say goodbye to the bimodal distribution and hello sunshine. Now, one of the things I like to point out on this graphic is on the lower left-hand corner, you can see the green zone, the yellow zones, and the red zones, right? Just right, a little bit towards too little and too much, and a, and a lot towards too little and too much. We have our warning system. And doesn't that look a lot like a statistical process control chart? And now I can see that I never broke down into the red, 
maybe there's an opportunity to reduce that buffer a little bit. I never had too much, really. So I'm this part is actually doing quite well. So I can eliminate this part from my to-do list. But if I have a part where I'm constantly up in the upper red or constantly down into the lower red, well, my continuous improvement projects are pretty much uh, handed to me. I don't have to think about it too much. Show me the graphs where I'm in the red, and those are the ones I need to work on. And by the way, when I get to that level, what do I need to work on? I have five places to go look to see what went wrong. Is my average daily usage connect, uh, calculation proper? Is my lead time correct? Is my variability assessment proper? Um, right? I have a limited list of things to go look at and figure out what went wrong. And then I can fix them. And a few days later, I can look at this graph again and see if what I did fixed what I was trying to fix. The DDMRP has proven to allow companies to plan and execute in the optimal range at strategically chosen points, right? At our strategic buffers. And that means that flow is protected. And it also means that the chaos calms down. So that's the, the presentation about the methodology. There's two upcoming workshops, uh, both online. The demand-driven SNOP experience is a uh, is an experiential learning workshop using something called the Fresh Connection, which is an amazing simulation that does just wonders at explaining how business um, decisions impact the business. And then the demand-driven planner, which is normally a two full day uh, in-person class, we're going to try and do four hours per day for four days in a row in an online scenario. So those are coming up. <clears throat> if you have uh, interest or want more information, Apex New Haven chapter website is posted here. And again, you'll get these slides. Demand Driven Institute is loaded with case studies and, and class schedules. Uh, I have my own company website. I have a blog site where I write uh, mostly about Demand Driven. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn and follow uh, my company LinkedIn page, Become Demand Driven, and shoot me an email. So a lot of ways to stay in touch, ask questions, um, and move forward through this process. So with that, I'd like to thank you for attending today. And if, uh, if you have any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.